Oh, yes. Zoom likes to move things around, too, I'm, I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, I'm JP Reinflush, and I'm with uh, Viver, and we are uh, looking at some work that you uh, sent over. So uh, before we begin, though, I'm, I'm kind of curious, how has your writing journey been so far? Well, so far, actually, it goes back a long way, like before smartphones, Google, and even Amazon. So yeah, I'm 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 a vintage creature, um, but that was all nonfiction. And uh, I was raising my daughter, so then I had to stop because I couldn't do my work and and that. And but I felt called recently to write fiction for middle grade, help kids. Um, work their way through the increased social emotional needs with all this pandemic stuff so there's a series i'll be writing uh, adventure annie it'll be adventure mystery series a middle grade series and a ya the new adult and you know I'm working on my first piece which is actually going to prequel which will be a standalone prequel which will be like a lead magnet for teachers and um understanding the the stuff with weaving the characters together is super important to me because this character web will be going through the various age aging series is <laughs> so yeah it's 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 a it's very important to me and i do like want to try to you know work it into my dna as to how i should be doing this yeah yeah and so you sent over um a lot of like character sheets and and sort of focusing on developing the character voices and between each other. But I'm curious, um, what in the next hour would you like to walk away with? What is the like couple of key things that you want to uh, leave this session with? Be like, yes, I know how to do this or I'm excited for this part. Is the, um, oh, I'll say, would write the white word be juxtaposition between each other? Um, okay. Just getting their voices and particularly how the protagonist seems is, are these things going to relate to her well? You know, granted, they will be growing over time, but for at least starting here, will they be relating well, or am I completely off base in how I have looked at this with what I've I've gleaned from um, your character encyclopedia on my, mm -hmm. my first time around? So there's some of them mm -hmm. are a little more flushed out than others. So it's like, does this work or are these two, you know, <laughs> no, you're not going to get anywhere with this combination because this, uh, this isn't moving her anywhere. That kind of thing. Right. That right. makes sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, So I'm going to start sharing screen, but I think that where I, I would like to start is sort of a conversation around um hypothesis because <laughs> one, of course I would. <laughs> and two, uh, I think that can help, um, figure out the overall character arc for Annie um, and make sure that in terms of emotional resonance that we're hitting those beats. And okay. there were a couple of notes in the file you sent me, um, if I can find it right, with Annie's desire to protect her family um, leads her to fulfill a need uh, to be taken seriously by means of proactively gathering intel and in parents and adult. Um, so, in terms of story hypothesis, it would be a sort of a desire to be the protector version of uh, to use that need to protect her family um, with a final need of understanding. And all throughout the story, it's this participation. Um, it's this way of being a part of a community that is driving the story. Uh, is that correct? <laughs> Um, yes, it is basically correct. Um, it's, you know, kids have a tendency to not always be heard when they say something. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like I had, had, you know, being an old fart now, I, I, I remember <laughs> those things as they were very pressing. So I just want to, you know, you know, illustrate that, that, you know, kids have a tendency to be more aware than often, um, adults give them credit for. And um, so, yeah, she is like a protagonist. She's young, but, and doesn't have lots of agency, but working through this as she can. Yes. So you are okay. Correct. Okay. So then how I would sort of see a character arc or a character journey flowing with these is if Annie has the starting off desire to protect, 
um, she might be oblivious to certain things because she's almost blindly protecting her family or she's like blindly um, uh, doing these acts. And then about halfway through, there's a discovery moment, a moment where she realizes this is not the right way to be maybe a part of this community or this is not the right way to um, do things. Um, and and you sort of have this this participation being this building drive throughout the story. So it's it's almost like every time she uh, is with a, a community or she's working for a community, maybe it's her family, maybe it's uh, something broader than that. Um, but every time that she does this, uh, she may start to chip away at, at her need to protect them because maybe she's realizing she's part of this like family unit. Uh, and then ultimately the end of the story being understanding would be this aha moment, this, uh, oh, in order to be all these things, maybe I just need to be taken seriously. Maybe I fit in over here, um, without needing to be this major big protector, but just being part of whatever this group is. Is that making sense? Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause she kind of shifted into needing to protect when she did tell her parents about this sneaky hooded figure and nobody mm. took her seriously. So, well, they're right. not, going, and I really feel there's something going on here. And so I need to go figure it out. Yes. Right. And then partway through, it's like, yeah, well, I'm a little kid. I can only go, I can go, least go so far with this. I'm getting to this point. I need, you know, adult help yeah. and uh, to finally in, engage that. And then, but understanding, realizing actually from both sides, her, what she really can and can't do. And her parents as well, you know, maybe we should just have listened a little deeper. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wonder too, there, and this is just um, something to think about as the story progresses, but I wonder if understanding and participation might be swapped and that okay. the understanding is sort of the thread that leads your story. So the lo the more that um, Annie understands things, the more she's rewarded with maybe at the final thing being part of the community as opposed to um, just being this like ideal protector, but like being part of something bigger. Makes better sense. And maybe that's why as I'm doing some stuff, it just felt not on target. So there's yeah. swap. So yeah. the participation is the end result, understanding it, that understanding of participation and the being taken seriously going through that, that feels better. <laughs> yeah. Actually. Yeah. And, and how that works too, is if you have understanding is the thread that plays through your story. That's where you can play with um, when Annie doesn't understand something, she doesn't get rewarded. Um, maybe she's unable to protect at the beginning. And then if she doesn't understand something halfway through, she gets pushed away or pushed back into this. Like you're not, you're not part of the taken seriously or part of the bigger family. You're still being treated as a kid because you're not understanding. And on the reverse, when she does understand something in the beginning, she gets to protect the family. And then halfway through when she does understand something, she gets to maybe get some knowledge or some information from the bigger part of the family because they take her seriously. So it's how you can play with um, the understanding need throughout the story um, and sort of that reward or that um, loss of reward, depending on how you uh, have that okay. function in the scene. Great. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that is, yeah. and does make very good yeah. sense. Good, good. And I think too, this having participation at the end being that like final bell, if you want to call it that, um, is really good for this sort of genre because it makes this a growing up story, which where someone needs to be part of a broader family, part of something where in this case, they're taken seriously. Um, and so it, it leads to that, like growing up kind of story. If that makes Great. sense. <laughs> yes, very much. So, so yeah, I would, uh, in, in your mind or, or whenever you're working through this, I would play with understanding as that developing thread and then focus on hitting that participation at the end. Very good. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So that makes a lot more sense because then what we can do with our characters is we can play with um, 
how they interact with Annie's, um, basically Annie's understanding or her development and how they treat her throughout the story based off of that. Um, yeah. So I started to put your characters into this like character voice sheet that Jeff sent me like years ago. That's probably outdated, <laughs> but regardless, um, I think that it's a good sheet to play with when talking about interacting with other characters and just yeah. understanding um, character based off of all of these sorts of choices that they make. I don't have a lot of like information on physical details and whatnot. You're more right. than welcome to fill those in if you want, if they're relevant to you. Um, but with Annie, based off of the documents, I pulled that personality, inquisitive, energetic, considerate, confident, very smart, pretty much a really good uh, a vehicle character, <laughs> okay. um, especially with the genre. Um, does does that resonate with the character that you're sort of developing yes. here? Okay. Yes. Um, that would make her voice something that's curious, inquisitive, uh, mm -hmm. brave at times too, um, mm -hmm. and potentially imaginative. I mean, we have uh, we have her seeing this this hooded figure and sort of exacerbating that as being a bad character that you know so it's it's this imaginative like uh bigger stakes sort of situation where it may not be um and so word choices that i would see with annie just as a, a baseline that everyone else can sort of interact with is expressive curious also articulate mm -hmm. pretty smart we have her as a, a very smart character um that would make her very active, engaged in a lot of like big, big gestures that she might do in terms of body language. Um, and with this sort of character, we might be, you know, I uh, focused on like cadence wise, the way that she talks mm -hmm. might be um, action or thought beforehand. So, um, you know, glancing at the map, I think we should go this way. Um, or depending, I'm, She's sort of smart and usually like when you get into that like heady intellect, usually characters are doing an action and then talking about it because they're processing how they're they're going to say the things that they need to say. But you also have her being this like young character and sometimes words vomit out <laughs> faster <laughs> than actions happen. I think it might that, not even be real words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that that's how you can play with um still the uh the innocence or the the childness of her uh, is yes. playing with the cadence that way where maybe when she's um put into a role where she's treated as a child um i'm just gonna write this here sure. uh as a chili <laughs> you know i can't spell <laughs> <I'll tell> <laughs> um <laughs> But we might see um, dialogue first here as opposed and then an action. And so she's saying like, what's going on? She, uh, Annie says as she lunges into the room. I don't know. But something where you can play with that sort of cadence in terms of how she speaks um, when she's treated as a child versus when she's left to like her own devices or when she's just treated normally. Um, and then pacing wise, uh, being this sort of like investigative person, she probably initiates the conversation first. She's really eager to share those ideas that she has, um, but will listen attentively to others. Um, and this will be like, if this is correct, this would function as her baseline. And then we can play with other modulations, like when she's with her parents or uh, when she's with an adult that treats her like an adult. Um, ah, maybe okay. some of these pieces extend a little more. Maybe she nice. becomes less um, uh, less open gestures, maybe, because she's trying to mimic that, uh, mm. that sort of adult action. So maybe she's trying to restrain herself here because to be treated like an adult is not to, like, be as extremely expressive as you are in a general state. Um, whereas opposed to maybe if she's with her parents and her parents are treating her like a child, um, she might fall into more of these quote unquote immature roles. Gotcha. 
Yes, and that's and that what you're saying here also helps me better understand what was meant by modulations. I was mm -hmm. thinking that was just in process through her journey within a story, but it's actually also just her presence among other people. Yeah. Different. Things. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah, that's exactly. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Very um, good. So this, this may not be true, but I'm just going to put this in as an example um, yeah. as like closed gestures or, or something that's more like astute um, and that's the potential of if she's being treated uh, as an adult. And then there are also these other options here where it depends on like a circumstance or uh, a role that she's put in. So if, for example, you have um, a character who is it, like has a job or has like a, a duty during the, the book and you want to play with that modulation, maybe they're a lifeguard. Um, sometimes that would be a role where they're as a lifeguard, they clearly would act slightly different than their average baseline self. Um, the one thing that you don't want to do is make these modulations so different from the baseline because they're all just little tiny facets of the main character. Um, characters don't become like a totally new brand new person um, in these modulations, unless you have, there, there are some people in this world <laughs> who will intentionally be a very different person, um, to different people. But uh, okay. unless you're writing that kind of person, I would mm -hmm. stick to minor yeah. modulations. Um, I say that only because like, there is the potential that you could be writing a character who is, um, intentionally, an extremely different person. Um, for example, in the queer community, um, I, there are a lot of things that if, for if I wasn't an out person, um, I may not uh, do with right. people that are maybe family or people I don't know versus people that know who I am as a person. I would have a lot more barriers to get to know that modulation. And so there might be even totally different words I choose, I might have completely different body language, but that's those sorts of modulations are either when you're intentionally hiding or concealing something about yourself. And so I, I'm just trying to like explain that bit so that when you go here and you look at modulations, don't change a ton unless you have a character that represents the need to. Right. Thank you. Yes, that's great. Yeah. The, but the biggest thing that would happen for her within this as far as between different modulations as far as through the story as opposed to different pieces of her being and her life with other folks would be that before this brave wasn't really a thing that came through for her you yeah. know but not brave but when she was fear became fearful for herself and family and wasn't being taken seriously like, i've got to go do this i've got to go do something yeah. on my own before so people can you know will take me seriously on this so that's about yeah. the biggest change for her after you know the inciting or the pot point one um so that's great thank you this is yeah this and is mm -hmm. and if brave is one of those things that develops out of her probably when she's with parents or treated as a child that's when um that's when that brave might diminish or might weaken um because she's being pulled back into that original version of herself um, that's one, one thing is, uh, based off of the story, your, your anchors pull them to the original version, not necessarily their bad version of themselves, but who they were at the beginning of the story versus, um, engines driving them to that new, um, new version. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So I think I understand Annie. Um, we're going to hop to Annie's mother who we've marked as an anchor, meaning that she pulls her back to her original version. Um, Personality-wise, I picked up on uh, professional, absent, but supportive, um, busy, caring, and distant in terms of voice, mm -hmm. which I don't know if any of this is not true. Please let me know. But yeah. what I would pick up on then is um, a little bit more formal, somewhat encouraging, though, um, mm -hmm in terms of like her word choices, like she 
how I could see that is uh, if Annie comes to her uh, saying, you know, I, I need help with blah, blah, blah. Her mother would be encouraging to Absolutely. whatever that, that bit is. Yes. Um, so she would choose words that um, don't aren't necessarily negative in those terms, but more like positive reinforcement kind of word choice. Um, it, being who her mother is, I picked up on like distracted and professional as terms of like body language. So she might not always treat Annie as her own child more like a a person that may need tending to occasionally or like she may be a little bit distracted um in terms of body language um does that fit with the character that you have in your head i think it does that yeah she is caring she loves her the way her job is is she's not there all the time there's he's gone a yeah. lot there's aspects of Annie's needs that she's not going to get, you know, she would always have to be brought up to speed because she is absent because of her work. Yeah. Yeah. So. And what, what again was, um, the mom's job? She, uh, works in archeology span and she's called out, oh, yeah. out yeah. of town, out of country to consult on these different things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, like you put her in a really big professional role, um, and she probably is, that's probably topical of mind, regardless of if she's at home or not. So it yeah. has this sort of like absentee expectation that her her child will be doing the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. But she's always encouraging of it. It's just that she's not, she's not there. Yes, um, so it's, it's more circumstantial anchor exactly. than, um, than like active anchor, if that makes sense. Yes, I I get I get what you're saying on that. Yes, and that's really on 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 the nose. Yes. Yeah. Uh, dialogue wise, um, a lot of like professional clarity. Um, I have here maybe dialogue first, um, and then sort of like pulling away from the conversation. Maybe she does actions where she like looks away, or or she does these different sort of like tending things. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, cadence wise, it could be. Um, because she's so distracted and absent, there might be this like dialogue first and then actions because she's just sort of saying what comes to mind because she's too focused on these other things. Um, I, I see this a lot, uh, with people who have like things very, that they're very focused on. They kind of will just say what, whatever. And, and it, unless you like ask them, like, what did you just say? They might turn and be like, I actually don't know. You know oh, what I mean? Um, I didn't think of that, but I, yes, that would be a, that would be a piece for sure. <laughs> yeah. And so in that case, the cadence might be like this dialogue first and then sort of a tag because she's just being this like reactive response and mm -hmm. it, it may be correct. It may be intelligent response. It may be exactly what uh, characters may need to hear. But if I would almost assume that if someone were to ask her to repeat what she just said, she might not be able to. Okay. Yeah. So surfing um, too many channels at the same time. You can't be aware of all. Exactly. Of them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and then pacing wise um, contributes when it's, when it needed um, usually the important information, um, but won't really dominate the conversation being this absent person. She's not, going to drive to dominate a conversation. So I could see if a uh, mom character and Annie were in a room together and Annie was talking to her mom about something that's happening, mm -hmm. there might be a start where her mother has to like take time to get into the conversation. Yeah. Uh, so Annie is going to be the first to talk. Annie is going to be like, hey, mom, I need to talk to you about something. And what, dear? But she's really not focusing at all. Mm -hmm. blah 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 blah. that's nice or you know something probably maybe incorrect but close to what annie wants as a response mom you're not hearing me looks at her has the conversation gives some good information that she needs but then gets pulled away again as the conversation goes so it's sort of this ebb and flow conversation um and probably unless something drags her mom into the conversation with like an emotional response of like, you're not listening to me or 
some sort of like anger response, I could almost see this being just sort of like semi-present. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Does does that fit with how your your mom character functions? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so modulation wise, I think that there's a potential for if she is if others are highly emotional around her is when she might modulate. Like if, mm. if others sort of get angry or aggressive towards her, um, I don't know if this is necessarily the, the right way to use this, this form, but I think that an emotional response of others makes sense here. Um, that might be when she's no longer distracted. She's um, becomes uh, more present. Yes. Yeah. Present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And still, still probably for formal probably mm -hmm. encouraging. I don't see a big change there, but definitely present. Um, and that might change the cadence just a little bit where she is at, now that she's present, she might take time to think about it because she wants to be formal and encouraging. And so therefore she might have a pause at the beginning and you might change that to be um, like action then dialogue. Okay. But those would probably be the only two changes I would do. Gotcha. Oh, this is great. This is helpful. Okay. Got dad character, another mm -hmm. anchor. Yes. Um, professional, accessible, and involved. So a little bit different. He's available. Um, supportive. So just as much as uh mother. Um oh, uh I'll I'll talk about anchors in a second. Um so we've got supportive, occupied, and approachable. Um with him, warm and conversational, conversational, but he's engaged. He's approachable. She can go to him when she needs advice and help. Um, dialogue kind of intermixes with actions. You know, let's solve this together um, sort of thing. And then uh, active participant in conversations, offers guidance, support, um, but allows Annie to lead. He, he gives Annie the opportunity to lead the conversation if she wants to. Um, so this is a, quite different than the mother character. Um, still encouraging though. Um, yeah. Yeah. You agree? You agree with the the sort of yeah. how he would probably talk? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So we have both the dad and mom as anchors though, and have we have them sort of pulling her into being the quote unquote worst version or the original version of herself, but yet they're almost encouraging of, of her as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make it so? Yes. And I, and that I makes did me wonder. Does it? Okay. <laughs> I, Cause I mean, at least in, in this story, he ends up being also an, an anchor. I, I thought, mm -hmm. you know, this is with my very fledgling understanding of stuff. Um, so in this uh, prequel story, he, they are are being anchors because they're not really, they're both being anchored because they're not hearing what she says when yeah. she puts something that is definitely a fear because they think she's just being dramatic. Um, mm -hmm. Not that like they think she is always dramatic, but this just seems, you know, how would you, how would you know this? How would you think this, you know? Yeah. Um, but I wasn't sure if that if I was really correct in in having him be a, an anchor also because he's he's physically there he can be more yeah. can work from home so if if he couldn't that would the family would be a a, a humongous mess of course <laughs> it is um, you know but there's Aunt Laura and she you know helps out with his the life choreography stuff but mm -hmm. um, he is very there for her and he is encouraging of her. And, and I think he is not really anchorish as I see him for overall stories, but in yeah. this particular instance, he was, um, you know, he was an anchor with everybody else. They were both distracted during this, what was supposed to be a family vacation because they both ended up having to do work things through what was supposed to be the family vacation. <laughs> Because I mean, if it's not a mess, there's no story, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, so, so I, I have a thought harder. here. <laughs> yes, what is? Yeah, you? and I have a thought here. So 
we have the dad character being approachable and sort of having this uh support to allow Annie to lead in a conversation. Mm-hmm. These all, if these are true, these all suggest to me someone who is fulfilling a participation need, yes. giving Annie the opportunity to participate as an adult almost. So even if he mentally thinks she's still a kid, um, you know, that he mentally is pushing her into this original self, he's encouraging her to be part of the family. And so because he's fulfilling her participation need, I think he might be an engine. Okay, that feels in, you know, honestly, that feels a better thing. And to be completely transparent, although the uh, the professions as they are here are are not actual, this actually is my mom and my dad. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. And where it came from, you know, he was very supportive and he was always there to, to hear and listen. But he wouldn't contest my mom if she had yeah. a thought on something or had a perspective on something. When we were all there, he would not fully express how he had been with me when she's there. So I was trying to because that has some interesting dynamics. Um, so I was trying to capture that in here, but you know, I barely know what I'm doing. So <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I, I think I think you've got it. I mean. I'm picking up on these pieces that make a ton of sense. So, and I think that that's a modulation that we'll quick play with, but I want to hop over to mom. Cause I do think, I do agree that she functions as the anchor um, in terms of the parents because mm-hmm. she's distracted. And so because this profession takes her away and maybe we have these like distant conversations, she's not fulfilling a participation need and therefore she's she's pushing Annie into these sort of childish moments, potentially, where Annie is like, you are not listening to me. Like, and she gets really upset or really frustrated, even if it's internal upset and frustration. <laughs> it's sort of creating this this version of herself that isn't who she intends to be because she's basically reaching out, saying, like, I want to be a part of something and I need to have a conversation with you. And there's no hand there to grab because for her mom, she's too distracted. So that's why I think that her mom really would function as that anchor. Now, what you just said here, the dad character is approachable when he's not with mom, but mom overrides. Yes. And so when they're together, it, it, they together become an anchor. But I think that dad separate is, um, yes, exactly. Is the engine. And so here, uh, if he's with mom, probably s- slightly uh, like warm conversational with maybe a little bit of sternness. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of to, to, I don't know if this fun- would be correct or not, but when talking about how you'd said um, – not supportive when around the mom character um if her point of view is different he will gravitate to hers when she's there (laughs) yeah so maybe stern's not the word but it it functions for now as like willing to to sort of put a foot down and and not have um that encouraging um aspect if it if it differs yes Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so well, it, it might yeah. it might cause his body language to be just a little bit more um restrained mm-hmm. as a potential but yeah i think that um yeah that would i'm going to put here um mother's anchor overrides yes her yeah um yeah okay yeah so then uh, what i could see here is a play with conversation is when she's with her dad alone Mm -hmm. she gets a lot of encouragement she gets a lot but you could have a scene where all three of them are together and it really pulls her into this like 
quote unquote dark place or like she no longer feels like she can have a conversation with him. So then it makes the next conversation with him alone. Yeah. Almost like a pins and needles until by the end of it, she feels good again. Like, oh, he is encouraging, but she may not recognize the difference. Yeah. But we start to see the difference. We see that when she's alone with her dad, she gets the encouragement. So even if she's in a dark place at the beginning of that conversation, it almost always ends positively. Um, or like she has this um, drive to to participate more. But mm -hmm. when she's with both parents, um, she may feel like they are sort of pulling back or like they uh, aren't being as supportive towards her. Yes. Got it. <laughs> cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Now we have Prisha, another anchor. Um, I'm going to pause the, here quick. How are you feeling yes. so far? <laughs> uh, this is amazing. I, you know, okay. I, I thank you, bless, that this is recorded. It's helpful because would I be able to internalize all this? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I see it and and just understanding a difference of of how I saw what the about what modulation, modulating yeah. is, that is so helpful. But hearing you see what, as far as what I could give you, what the difference that you're just really nailing it. And it's so, so helpful because now I can Good. see, I, you know, different scenes start flopping in my head and say, oh, yes, this, oh, that wouldn't have happened. But yes, this way. So this is fantastic. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. The the hope here is if you have scenes written, maybe you go back to them and um, especially scenes that you're like, I don't know, something was weird or off about yes, this. Exactly. You can look at this and you can be like, well, of course it's off because she's being encouraged, but both her parents are there and yeah. maybe it, that wouldn't be the case. So yes. this is like, yeah, one of the ways to play with that. Super. Um, do, do I okay. get the sheet or how I could work with Yeah, this? yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. You get the sheet afterwards <laughs> and you can add and change and do whatever you need to it to make it uh, fit for you. Um, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. I actually, Jeff and I used this for nerds cause we had a huge cast of characters. Um, <laughs> and, um, I think I I looked at it once, but I needed that once to to really grasp, and then I was good. So, gotcha. um, yes. yeah, use this as much or as little as you need to, but hopefully it'll it'll help kind of sink or, or uh, Fantastic. solidify. To see them all across in a single space versus the across the all the, the pages and boxes is spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So we have Prisha, another anchor, um, mm -hmm. who seems reluctant, negative but occasionally helpful um, notes on voice, skeptical, unpredictable, a bit cynical um, word choices would be a lot of like questioning and maybe a little bit blunt. Um, not really too concerned about Annie's feelings will be like sort of questioning, like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, body language would be potentially like reserved and, um, potentially dismissive, you know, a, a shrug of the shoulder, maybe like a just we're done here, sort of turn and walk away kind of thing. Um, and then dialogue wise, um, a bit of he hesitance or reluctance. Um, maybe there's like, especially when you have skeptical characters, um, think about like in real life conversations when someone's a bit skeptical, they, you know, they, they raise their eyebrow while, while you're talking and they're like, as you're talking, they may be like already thinking of their answers. So like they're doing these actions before they talk because they're listening to what you say and they're rearranging it to whatever their worldview is to ask questions and be like, mm, I don't think you're right. Like, I think that blah, 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 blah. But like you can when you sort of strip someone down into like what kind of like character they are and if Prisha is a skeptical person then uh, you can play up what that skeptical looks like as a character. And it might be when Annie is trying to tell her about like hooded figure, she's, you know, doing these sorts of actions, thinking like, well, no, you know, like, well, pause. She pauses as she uh, looks up at the ceiling. I think you're wrong, blah, 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 blah. So that's how like dialogue wise you could play with that. It's interesting because what you're saying is how that character space sounds more like her best guy pal than Prisha. But Prisha's just, she's fearful. I mean, she, mm. she 
likes Annie. She would like, I think, to be like Annie, but she okay. just afraid. She's very um, like quiet, more introspective, contemplative, but the things that Annie wants to do to like go investigate this stuff. At, okay. So, okay. She's, a, she's just more fearful. So the, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can do that. <laughs> type yeah. Of so let's not let's from a point a of, of, um, Oh, you gotta be nuts, but just that yeah, I can't quite wrap my <laughs> energy around that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But, so let's change that up then. So uh, fearful, hesitant, concerned, Yes, sorts yeah. of voice uh word choices uh would be um more negative right mm -hmm. she'd probably have more negative or like catastrophizing word choices right um and then um i'm just gonna put negative because <laughs> yeah. i can't think of other other words off the top of my gotcha. head um i think body language of reserved but probably mm -hmm. not dismissive probably yeah, no. uh what would you call that like caved in sort of like uh, um uh, right caved in yeah caved but in. a lot of like needing to to protect herself and so yes. like when people need to protect themselves they're they're very like caved in they have this sort of like hunch over sort of like meager um aspect to them um, yes Mm -hmm. and so if that's like her as a baseline character um yeah she would just appear small a lot of the time mm -hmm. <laughs> um <laughs> i still think uh hesitation and reluctance but different yes. now yes. a lot of like oh, i'm not sure i'm a little nervous about this um yes. i think waits for others to speak um may interject but with with concern with reluctance not with skepticism but just with reluctance perfect um yeah. that makes more sense yeah does do you think that prisha changes when she's around other people or do you think that this is a really big driving factor like she's just always nervous i think um, she's always more like this there will be growth for her definitely over time but um and a, and a, a little bit in in actually this story but whereas she kind of like go along with some things to a certain point but she's still <laughs> afraid she's still all these things but you know hasn't gone yeah. runs the hill <laughs> so yeah yeah and yeah, so that's like kind of, that's just kind of her <laughs> yeah i could see when when you develop her as a character maybe she you know alters in this like caved in this maybe she starts to like peek out of that um as she grows but if in this story she remains this way this might just be her character especially being an anchor she kind of functions as you know she's probably not going to have a big growth arc at the moment <laughs> yeah no yeah but you know they're both the young and they're they're together so it is a a tough thing for her when you know annie starts wanting to go out and do these things yeah uh, but she is present. But yeah, she is definitely an anchor. Not that she's mean or doesn't care, but she just she's just not in the same. Ha ha! Let's go! Let's do type of deal. Well, so here's a, here's a question for you. Uh, not to not to muddy any waters, but when Annie is around Prisha, mm -hmm. and they have conversations, by the end of the conversation, is Annie more driven? to do whatever is needed to be done for the story L like to be done for her growth arc to be done for getting the participation more i wouldn't say um more she still ends up doing what she's going to do um mm -hmm. and sometimes i try and do in encourage let's say encourage maybe influence and Prisha, well, this will be okay. And, you know, we're yeah. going to do this, but it'll, it'll be all right. And Prisha's like, mm -hmm, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I don't think she, uh, Prisha acts as something that's driving her forward to it, but she doesn't pull her away from it. Does that right. make sense? So it her does. influence is a little more neutral. She's present. Annie cares about her. They do talk. They, they, they appreciate each other, but it's just, they're just very different. Yeah. So the, the reason I, 
I state that is because I I wonder about mm-hmm. the anchor only because it's a, a way of thinking about Prisha. Because when when you think about like trio friends uh, in a story, usually one of them is always the, the fearful one or the, the one that's like, I don't know if we should be doing this. It's so nervous. But when we look at like the main character, that fear from that character still drives them forward. It still it still tells them like, I know you're scared, but we're gonna do this. Like it it, it incites this feeling in that vehicle character to keep moving forward. Okay, and so well, it's I- not that mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's not that like the character is an anchor because they're negative. It's more the character is an anchor because they pull that character away from whatever growth they need to make. So if in fact Prisha being this negative person is pulling out the positive aspects of Annie to continue on this journey, then she may be an engine. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I, I hear what you're saying and I, I'm not seeing her completely as that, or haven't been seeing mm-hmm. Annie responding to her in that way, but that is, yeah. that is food for thought. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. 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 I think that in terms of, Right now for voice, mm-hmm. I don't think you need to worry too much about the anchor thing at the moment. Okay. I, would, I yeah. would just focus um on this bit. And I think that I think this helped. Um, is there such a thing as a neutral person? <laughs> hazard. I mean, okay. but usually yes, they're not like uh yes, I don't think she's that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think she's that. But um the false anchor. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> the false anchor, maybe. <laughs> or maybe she develops into an engine later in the in yeah the, in the, yeah over time I think she may yeah. well but no, she isn't yeah. yet yeah um yeah I mean again just food for thought yes great mm. um let's talk about Auntie Laura we've got an engine character um realist charming planner um grounded compassionate and organized uh word choices seem practical and warm. Mm, so that's good. Mm-hmm. similar to uh, the dad character of warm and conversational, but this one is more has just a little bit of a difference to it being more practical about whatever sort of conversation mm-hmm. and engaged in nurturing. So kind of like a, a motherly character that is more engaged than the mom character Yes, um, and probably treats Annie like an adult. Um Probably still in the nurturing aspect, maybe in her mind, she's like, she's still a kid, but she's at least allowing Annie to participate and to maybe fail um, in order to grow that sort of nurturing aspect to it. Um, Delivers dialogue with a sense of purpose and thought. Um, So in that sense, uh, she probably does action than dialogue more often than not Mm -hmm. to make sure that her word choices have thought behind them Mm. because whenever whenever i'm thinking about like delivering dialogue with thought i'm thinking about usually people having to have a moment to make sure that the words that they say are correct and so whenever you have that usually um when you see the dialogue it'll probably be like an action first or like um, Auntie Laura stood and said, blah, 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 whatever she goes to say, because she's taking this moment to say it. Now, this won't be a hundred percent of the time. Right, right. Of yes. course, because that would be silly if we always had Auntie Laura do that, but more than likely that's how she'll deliver dialogue. Yes. And um, that is like quite, sounds quite perfect. Cause it's like, she's kind of like Annie's second mom, like the mm-hmm. more mom of mom and she doesn't have her own kids. So she, she really wants to provide what she can for her yeah. Annie. Yeah. She, and because she loves Annie, she loves her sister and, but you know, her sister isn't there and she lives super close by. And so, yeah, she's very nurturing and mommy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, pacing wise engages actively in conversation. Uh, lots of insights and guidance um, will balance listening and speaking. So she won't overpower a conversation, um, but she won't, I don't think she'll let other people overpower the conversation as well. <laughs> exactly. 
So whenever she's in something, if someone is trying really hard to overpower it, I could see her yeah. st- sort of in uh, doing things in the way that she talks and the way that she acts to to push them down a little bit to be like, why don't you let Annie speak? You know, you've you've had your turn. Let's mm-hmm. have Annie talk. That sort of mediator between the two. Yes, yeah, um, mediator. Yeah, yeah. Let me um will will act as a mediator. Um and depending on if you have any moments like this, I could see Auntie Laura being that mediator if you ever needed it. So this would alter her a little bit because she may not be as um warm. She may become a little bit more of that motherly sternness. Mm -hmm. If she, even with like, even with Annie's dad, (laughs) probably Annie's dad, probably not Annie's mom, but if she needed to take this role with an adult, she still would be that motherly, like we're going to have this conversation and we're going to, we're going to get through this moment. So if she has that, I could see, um, something like that happen. Do you have a plan for that? Yes. Yes. You do. Yes. Okay. Then let's, um, I'm going to put her as a role as a mediator. Um, and I'm going to put, uh, will words that are maternal, maybe. Or like protective. Um, body language here, I could see becoming a little bit more um, like astute or like stern, I guess is a good potential there. But then here, I think that these two, the cadence and the pacing will probably be about the same. Um, but she will... Um, encourage others or or uh demand almost Mm -hmm. uh balance so she could really function as uh a mediator character i think yes definitely yeah um does that work for for this character absolutely any any questions here no no that that's that is great Okay, we have BFF. Um, intellectual, considerate, and a planner. Smart, thoughtful, systematic. Which which character again was the 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 skeptical one that you had mentioned? Uh, her best guy pal. Best guy pal. Okay, I just want to make sure that it's not this one. Um, no. Here, I, I saw analytical and thorough, uh, empathetic and uh, deliberate. Um, uh, well thought out. Um might this character if if they are analytical and they they're they are intellecting as other people are talking they might have dialogue first because they're already engaged in the conversation and they're they're ready to say their words quickly Mm -hmm. um and so they might have dialogue first and then sort of actions as it comes because they're a couple steps ahead of everyone yeah mentally at least Yes. yes, I have a best friend who's very, very much that she's very much like <laughs> I she yeah. she's energetic and creative and stuff, but she is just uh very brilliant. And it's just I sometimes some of this might sound like it's from two different people, but it is really there is a person that's truly like this and she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And yeah, so especially when we're talking like high analytical, I can definitely see dialogue first. Um, with those because they're la- they're more engaged in the conversation, but like so much so that they're just ready to spew out information. Yep. We'll think before speaking, um, but we'll contribute those valuable insights or suggestions um, and respect the flow of conversation. So they won't overtake a conversation. They'll allow others to speak, but it they <laughs> if they need to, they will lead a conversation and they will they will take you um, for a ride if you need one. Um, mm-hmm. Do is there any like major modulations that you want to play with with this character, or is this um 
someone that we kind of just see as mostly baseline? Um, and, you know, exactly on this, it's there be some, it's hard to say, because actually when we get to the uh, first book of the series between this book and then the, the first book of the series, um, Annie's parents will end up separating. And, okay. uh, yeah. And so, you know, the friend will, uh, BFF will be there a lot for her and be a little, um, torn because she doesn't know, you yeah. know, this, yeah. that aspect of life and stuff, but wants to be there for Annie. So she'll have, you know, wanting to be there, but in an unusual state for her, not very knowledgeable about you know, what to do and to help. So yeah, she will have that kind of a modulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be like the after divorce and they will have all of these aspects, but feel mm -hmm. a little lost yes. because they're so intelligent, but they're not intelligent on this subject. This, exactly. And that's going to, that's going to push on them. Yes. Um, so, uh, and I know that this might not be for this, this book, but let's just quick play with yeah. this for a second. Perfect. So um, word choices still very, very thoughtful. And I think that they would have some hesitancy uh, in their cadence. Um, yeah, exactly. So they, they won't, they won't be ready for words. Yeah. They might take longer pauses or they might be in the middle of a sentence and realize that they might be saying the wrong thing and have to pause in the middle of it. So that, that might be um, sort of a play on cadence. Um, still empathetic, still very deliberate. Um, will not uh will not lead a conversation because they especially when it's about the divorce i think that they'll pull back on the conversation um or i still think respect the flow of conversation works but it may not be a balanced conversation they might be like i don't know how much to talk during this is too much to listen so they might be more of a listener role if they're the the empathetic part is what's pulling me towards more likely yeah. than being a listener. Yes, exactly. Okay. Making sense? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, perfectly makes sense. Um I believe, yeah, this is the last character I have mapped out is your best guy, pal. Mm -hmm. Um and we're gonna I'm gonna already put this in here because uh we were just talking about this. If I know how to spell, which whatever, it's close enough. Um, okay. Uh, notes on personality, realist, humorous, and steady, pragmatic, funny, and reliable. Uh, do those resonate? Yes. Okay. Um, straightforward, witty, but skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, relaxed and expressive. If they are a character that, and this doesn't necessarily make them a negative character, although they are potentially an anchor. Um, if there's someone that thinks that they know everything, they might have more of a relaxed personality. Um, interestingly enough, your analytical character, I don't think has that relaxed personality and they're probably more intelligent, but <laughs> if a character thinks that <laughs> I think like, they know everything, they, you know, they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of those kind of characters usually has like a relaxed, know it all sort of attitude. Um, especially if they have this like, skepticalness to them i could see them having um sort of this like relaxed but still expressive like yes. i'm gonna own the conversation sort of thing exactly. um quick to comment probably with humor um and then uh interjecting with comments i'm gonna say might initiate um would you agree might initiate a conversation. Oh yeah, definitely. He would initiate a conversation. Uh, uh, and then would probably look for the last word in a conversation as well. He would probably, yeah, it's not going to be a uh, have to have to, but yeah, he was. Yeah. So occasionally seeks the last word. Um, Okay. Do you have any um, modulations that you'd want to play with this best guy, pal? Yeah, for in this story, no, because he's not as present in this one. Mm -hmm. While because they're away, it's a it's you know it's a novella and they're away a good part of the time, so 
he's doing, they're more DMing, you know, direct messaging than getting to spend time talking with each other. So I don't okay. see him modulating so much in this, in this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause if, if at any point like this best guy pal and this BFF mm -hmm. uh, meet or have to work with each other, that will be an interesting modulation between the oh, two. Oh yes. They will, um, you know, through other stories, they will definitely be meeting. All, yeah. Cause all you have, um, they are all together in, in a, in a, like one or two scenes in the very early part of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that'll be something fun for you to think through is yeah. how a conversation will flow between those two, because you have someone who is pseudo know-it-all, and then you have someone who actually knows things, but is, yeah. is more relaxed. So that'll be a fun, fun play. Um, okay. We have the mediator. I think that one is a really good one. Prisha, I think that if Prisha and the BFF ever work together, the BFF could help push down some of Prisha's fears. Oh, okay. Well, that that would make sense. Yeah, thank you. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have any any moment where Prisha, BFF, and Annie are together, I could see um, the BFF um, helping. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I think yeah. you're right. Um. Yeah. I think otherwise. I for some reason, mom character and Auntie Laura mm -hmm. seem like opposing ends of a magnet or like repelling forces. So, in that sense, I don't see them coming together often. And if they do, I almost feel like it. It, it won't be. Um big modulations that they'll just kind of be there. I don't know how to explain it, but just kind of like there, as opposed to when auntie Laura and dad care, dad character around, I yeah. see more interplay between the two. Um, probably auntie Laura pulling out good aspects of the dad character, um, making him even more engaged, um, probably pulling out certain, um, questions and, and, uh, getting him more involved in a conversation to make sure that he is um being the yeah dad. like a positive aspect if that makes sense that does make sense yes okay okay do you have any other questions well there we i do up? have one other question because there was the one other character sheila who oh yeah yeah person they meet locally and you know and i don't have a hazard and i was gonna make her an engine but i think it's just because i don't really get enough of hazard um because she they're going to see her with times and she will be help move them forward and then mm -hmm. she and, and auntie laura you know share some time together with the both the girls in you know moving the parts forward they actually need adult before mom and dad are on board with anything <laughs> yeah. um but so i didn't know um as far as hazard like what, what they are be, she shouldn't be in the in the story frequently or but each or maybe that each time she is there she brings out stuff that helps move them forward even though so i i just yeah she's what i think i'm most confused on <laughs> so or just hazards, hazards yeah. yeah hazards show up as like tertiary characters in a story they function as um, things that are an obstacle for your character to learn from mm -hmm. um, once, twice, something along those lines. Not often enough because really um, I think the reason that they would be called a hazard is because since they show up so infrequently, they don't um, they don't make the character drastically grow but they offer a <clears throat> foundational moment for your character to have. So they could grow in that moment, but overall in the big scheme of the story, you have these engines and anchors that have been there the whole time that have been helping them grow. So if Sheila maybe shows up three times in Annie's story, yeah, she that's could very... potentially be a hazard if she's not... Um, if she's just functioning as sort of like this, this thing for Annie to, to 
overcome. Um, what what does Sheila can can we get some information on Sheila? Yeah, she's she's uh, of course this takes place in in Victoria, Canada, and mm -hmm. Sheila is a long time local in just this area of old early Victoria, and um, so she's very knowledgeable. You know, had tribal knowledge, a lot of tribal knowledge about what goes on there. She understands how the government stuff works, and that is something that the girls need to look into when they try to help this hooded figure it turned out not to be dangerous but a struggling person that they want to help and um so she she knows stuff about they learn from her i'm mean, she's very she's very kind and helpful but they actually just learn from her just in a couple of meetings in the coffee shop where they originally with mom and dad and Auntie Laura happened to run across her, they end up trying to get some information from her on a couple of different occasions. And she is realistic in how she presents it, but and they learn from her. And in a way, she is supportive, at least in one of those scenes. Okay. So they're actually kind of with her on three different occasions. Okay. All in a coffee shop. I mean, she doesn't come over to the house, the Airbnb yeah. thing or anything like that. Yeah. I, it sounds like she sort of serves as an information booth. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that if she's not showing up often, she probably functions as a hazard. She offers up um, information when needed mm -hmm. in order to help the... Uh, the story continue um so yeah, i would agree sure. probably a hazard in that sense um because and especially because she's an adult and you have children sort of like looking for information if the children give up too much information uh maybe sheila will be like uh what are you doing like <laughs> you yeah, know like exactly she tries to yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So it's it still functions as like it, it's not just Sheila being an information booth and spouting out information, but like Annie has to be careful how she talks to Sheila um, because there there's a risk that uh, too much information and all of a sudden uh, whatever her goal is or her attempt um, might fail because um, Sheila might see through whatever they're trying to get um, out of her. Um yeah, so, I mean, you have sort of a, a I'm trying. I'm like putting myself in this the shoes of Sheila, who might be, um, <sighs> inquisitive. No, not inquisitive. That's not the right word. But obviously word choices will be informative, knowledgeable, you know, those sorts of like, she'll probably be quick to state whatever's needed. Uh, you could put her in a questioning sort of personality where maybe she is, she herself is like, what do you want this information for? Mm -hmm. Um, and that could be, um, that could be a way that Annie has to work around, um, understanding, how much information to give to someone and you could have maybe like one time where um annie fails at uh understanding how to talk to an adult like sheila and get the information she needs maybe she gets like half of it instead um and mm -hmm. she has to work with that but Especially, you know, I was saying the word understanding for a reason, because as we're growing and developing Annie's character, she needs to understand how to how to talk to certain people, how to get information that she needs in order to function in the community that she's trying to to be a part of. Yes. Um, and so I could see that being um, Sheila having, um, I guess this is more of like inquisitive body language which to me is like a lot of um you know folding the arms um mm -hmm. don't do this all the time but raising of the eyebrow you know that kind of like yeah i would like to know more information about what you are um why you're talking to me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um sort of thing um why do you know this <laughs> 
And then cadence wise, um, she probably would be someone who would uh, have an uh, action first and then a dialogue because she's processing what information is being um, asked of her and then processing the information. So it's probably like action plus dialogue because um, uh, depending on what is being asked of her, she probably has a repository of information that she has mm -hmm. to like think through. So she's yes. not as prepared in a conversation because people probably ask of her random things that she has to um, contemplate. Um, pacing wise, I mean, she's, the way you described her to me, she's not someone that's going to like initiate a conversation, um, at least with Annie. Um, but she will, um, she will answer and she could, she has the potential to dominate based off of the information. If she loves giving information, she might overshare. Okay. If she, uh, uh yeah. Mm -hmm is questionable about children asking her certain questions she might hold back and that might be a modulation based off of like if she's super knowledgeable about the area and she wants to share that with other people she's really excited to do that but then if kids start asking her specific mm -hmm. questions that she starts to question why are they asking me this she might start to restrain and that might be a modulation to play with but Perfect. we don't see her a lot on the page so it no. yeah, you don't want to do too many modulations um I'm going to put might overshare, mm -hmm. but uh, um, hopefully that note makes sense. And then if you yes. want to play with a modulation, you could. Yeah, um, Thank you. But yeah, that's kind of how I see uh, her, her, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Yes. Very okay. good. Yeah. Right. That's so helpful. <laughs> I have good. no idea how helpful that is. <laughs> and good, I'll, good. I'll I'm glad. marinating myself in, in re-listening to this <laughs> a few times. <laughs> I work Excellent. through different things. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. This has been such a spectacular opportunity. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, As, uh, you know, being, you know, super newbie girl in fiction, it's like, whoa, it's a, such a different <laughs> world. <laughs> yeah. You have control. Um, Oh, you have control. <laughs> That's a problem in itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording now. Yes. Uh, and then we will chat for a second.